Okay, in this video, we're going to look at the notion of a kernel of a homomorphism. So let's recall what a homomorphism is. So if we've got two groups, G1 and G2, and a function between them, which we'll call phi, so it goes from G1 to G2, it's called a homomorphism if for all X and Y in G1, if you do phi applied to X, Y, you should get the same thing as phi applied to X times phi applied to Y. So here the multiplication is happening in G1, and here the multiplication ha is happening in the second group, G2. Now, an important object that we want to introduce in this video is something known as the kernel. So the kernel of homomorphism phi is given by all elements x in G1, in other words, in the domain, where if you apply the homomorphism phi, you land at E2. So we're going to say that E2 is the identity of the codomain, in other words, the group G2. So this is everything that gets mapped to the identity. And notice that can be rewritten as the inverse image under this map phi of E2. Okay, good. So uh, let's look at some examples. Maybe first let's look at the example phi from Z to Z5. And, well, you might say, well, how are we going to define this map? Let's say we just define the map uh, that takes the integer n to its equivalence class over here in Z5. So let's just recall that Z5 is going to be made up of uh, five equivalence classes. 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And how you get those is just by uh, taking the remainder after dividing by 5. Now, uh, let's calculate the kernel of this thing. So notice the kernel of phi in this case will be all n and z such that when we apply um, phi to n, we should get the identity over here in z5. But notice that identity is the same thing as the equivalence class uh, 0. But now notice that's the same thing as all n and z such that the equivalence class for n is equal to the equivalence class for 0 because... That's exactly how we're defining our function phi. But finally, that's the same thing as all n and z, such that n is congruent to 0 mod 5. But everything congruent to 0 mod 5 means that it is a multiple of 5. So in other words, this is equal to 5z. So the kernel here is 5z. Okay, so for our next example, let's take phi maybe from the real numbers to the complex numbers under multiplication. So this is the real numbers under addition that we're taking to the complex numbers under multiplication. And let's say we take phi of x is equal to e to the 2 pi i times x. Okay, great. Now, uh, let's figure out what the kernel is in that case. So the kernel of phi in this case, so that's going to be all real numbers x, such that when we apply phi to x, we should get the identity in c. And so in other words, e to the 2 pi i x, so that's what we get when we apply phi to x, should be equal to the identity in c, uh, where our... Um, Operation is multiplication, so we need e to the pi i x equals 1. But if you recall that that is the same thing as saying uh, cosine 2 pi plus i, sorry, cosine 2 pi x um, plus i sine 2 pi x equals 1 by using Euler's formula. But what that tells us is that cosine 2 pi x equals 1 and sine 2 pi x equals 0. But this has infinitely many solutions and the infinitely many solutions that it has are all of the integers. So what that tells us is that x is in fact in z. So, in fact, here we have the kernel of phi is actually um, all of the integers.
Okay, great. So now I'm going to clean up the board and then we're going to prove um, an important result regarding kernels. Okay, so the result that we want to prove is that the kernel of a homomorphism is a normal subgroup of the domain. So here I haven't written the setup, but what we have is the setup is that phi is a homomorphism from G1 to G2. Now this can actually go really, really quickly using a previous result, using the fact that the subgroup containing only the identity is normal, and then the inverse image will preserve normality. But that's not we're gonna how, how we're going to do it because I think we lose something by um, having such a short proof. We'll do this from scratch, if you will. So first thing we need to do is show that it's a subgroup, and then we'll show that it is a normal subgroup. So in order to do that, we're going to use the subgroup test, which says that H is a subgroup of G if and only if... Um, for all x and y in h, x times y inverse is in h. So that's what it takes for h to be a subgroup. So let's suppose that x and y are in the kernel of phi. And then let's consider x times y inverse. And so notice that them being in the kernel of phi is equivalent to saying that phi of x is equal to the identity and that's also equal to phi of y. So the entry phi into the kernel is you get mapped to the identity. So now what we'll do is we will apply phi to this object, but using the fact that phi is a homomorphism, that's going to give us phi of x times phi of y inverse. So we can bring the inverse out because it's a homomorphism. We can split it up because it's a homomorphism. But then again, this gives us E times E inverse, which is just equal to the identity E. Okay, fantastic. So what this tells us is that X, Y inverse is in fact in the kernel of phi. And thus, by the subgroup test, the kernel of phi is a subgroup of the domain. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we will prove that it is a normal subgroup. Okay, so we just finished proving that the kernel is a subgroup of the domain. Now we want to show it's a normal subgroup of the domain. So there's a lot of equivalent definitions of it being a normal subgroup, but we'll use the following one. N is a normal subgroup of G, if and only if, for all N and N and X in G, we have X in X inverse is in N. So since we want the kernel to be a normal subgroup, what we will do is we will take um, X from just the group as a whole, in other words, G1 in this case, because that's our domain, and then we will take um, N from the kernel of phi. And our goal is that X in X inverse should be in the kernel of phi. And so remember, being in the kernel of phi means when you apply phi, you should get the identity. So that's what we should do. We should apply phi to X in X inverse. Now, if we get the identity out of that, that means that this object is in the kernel. So let's see if that works. So because this is a homomorphism, we can write this as phi of X phi of n, and then phi of x quantity inverse. Good. But now, since phi of n is the identity, we can essentially just erase it because we're multiplying by the identity in the middle, and that's going to give us phi of x times phi of x quantity inverse, but that's the product of uh, two, an inverse pair, so that gives us the identity. So now the fact that if you apply phi to x in x inverse, you get the identity. That's exactly what it takes for x in x inverse to be inside the kernel of phi. So let's see what we did. We took an element from the group as a whole. We took an element from the kernel and we showed that that conjugate element, that's what you call an object like this, is also in the kernel. But that's exactly what we need for this kernel to be a normal subgroup of the domain. And now recall from a previous video, anytime you have a normal subgroup, it's important to look at the quotient group. And that's exactly what we'll do in a forthcoming video. But here we'll end.